Okay, um, today is July 14th, 2011. My name is Mary Larson. I'm here with Michelle Smith uh, in Edmond, Oklahoma. Thank you so much, Michelle, for being here. We really appreciate your help with this project. My pleasure. Um, I'd like to start by just asking you some basic biographical questions. Okay. Uh, when, when and where were you born, and can you tell me a little bit about your family? Sure, I was uh, born in, in Plainfield, New Jersey. I grew up in Califon, New Jersey. And um, Califana is actually a really, really rural part of New Jersey, out on the western part of the state. And um, I loved growing up there. My mom grew up on a dairy farm. My father grew up in uh, Clinton, New Jersey, but worked on a, a farm. And so the western side of New Jersey is actually, you know, very rural, very farmlandish. Um, you know, a lot of people think of New Jersey as being highways and cities, and what exit are you from? <laughs> but uh, New Jersey is actually a really beautiful state. It's called the Garden State for a reason. And um, yeah, it was a blessing to be able to uh, have grown up out in the country. I got to play outside a lot and um, I kind of grew up a country girl uh, in, in the state of New Jersey. I had an older sister and younger sister and my parents were very active and had us play a lot of different sports and um, which wasn't an easy feat because when you grow up out in the country, that means mom's a taxi taking you into all the different events. And my father drove into work every day into a plain field is where he worked uh, for public service, electric and gas. But it really was a great childhood because of just the, the environment. It was a beautiful area to be. How far out of town did you live? Well, the, the mailing address that we had was Califon, New Jersey. We were actually about five miles up the mountain, so on a rural drive route. <laughs> so <laughs> the only thing at the top of the mountain really was a, a group of maybe 15 to 20 homes. Um, and it wasn't really even a neighborhood. It was just homes sporadically each on probably an acre or so of land and um, you would have to drive down the mountain to Califon to that would be the closest uh, shopping center and that was even Califon is a very small town. Clinton however was a little bit larger but that was about 15-20 minutes away. Okay. Now with with that setup, did you have a lot of kids in the neighborhood to play with at some of the other homes or was it mainly your your own siblings or? No, we did have other children in the neighborhood, which was great, other mm -hmm. kids for us to play with. Um, most of the kids my age were boys, so I, that's how I ended up playing a lot of sports because of course the boys wanted to play, you know, baseball, flies and grounders, football, tag football, and um, you know, whatever sport was in season we would end up playing basketball. Um, my older sister was um, a little more social. She would play with friends that she possibly knew through school. My mom would drive her to friends' house to play and there were a little bit more um, you know, playing with dolls, stuff like that. Not as sports oriented, although she did play softball. My younger sister was a little bit more like me. She kind of tried to tag around, you know, with me. So. You always have the younger yeah, sister. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, how did you first get involved with um, organized sports? Okay. Well, with organized sports, um, a lot of it was through the uh, grammar school system, but also for softball, it was through a recreational um, league basically that a ta the township set up and my father, I wanted to play baseball and my father said well when you get to high school you're going to play softball so you can't play baseball you have to play softball. You have to play with the girls and um, so I played for a athletic association out of Highbridge which was another bordering little town down the mountain and uh, my mom was one of the coaches and my dad would play catch with me every day he got home from from work. I don't even think I let him get out of the truck before I was throwing his glove at him to play catch with me. But uh, my mom coached my older sister and myself and my younger sister. But that's kind of how it started is that uh, my mom and some of her friends coached their daughters and I got to watch my older sister play and of course I wanted to play so they snuck me in even though I was a little bit too young and, <laughs> and uh, ended up being a great thing. We also played in a church league as well. And, um, and then for our school team. So at one point during the year, I would be playing for, for three different teams, the High Bridge Association, the church league, or the church team, and then for my grammar school team. So what was, how old were you when you started getting into the organized teams? About five or six years old, seven years old. I was, so I was a little bit young. I think the age, the start age was like seven or eight, and I think I started playing at like six, seven. Um, because my older sister was was playing, she was three years older than I was. So, so I started pretty young, and I, but you know at that age I'm just you know running around chasing the ball actually. So I didn't start to pitch till I was 15, until I got to high school. But I played shortstop, outfield, a little bit of everything when I was younger. Mm -hmm. So they had they had teams when you were in grammar school though organized. They did. They had an organized uh, team for the school that would play other uh, elementary or grammar schools 
within the area. So New Jersey was pretty good that way. They had mm-hmm. a lot of um, sports and athletic associations outside of schools, but then act- actually for schools as well within the school system. So we would play other grammar schools within a, I don't know, I would say probably a 30, 40 mile radius. Wow, that's pretty good. Yeah, it, it was really good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, could you tell me a little bit about your high school years? Mm-hmm. My high school years, um, I went to Voorhees High School, which was in uh, Hunterdon County, and is the sister school of North Hunterdon Regional High School, which is the school that my parents went to. So, um, Voorhees High School was a, a newer school, actually. I think I was actually the tenth class to graduate through that high school, um, and I played uh, I played field hockey, basketball, and softball while I was in high school and. Uh, in grammar school, I had played softball and basketball. I basically took up field hockey in the fall because I just wanted to stay in shape for basketball season. And, you know, I was a busybody athlete, so I was always having to do something. Right, you had to have something in it, fall. Exactly, yeah. something to do in the fall. So it worked out, um, worked out really well. But Voorhees High School was a great institution. I had um, very good teachers. We had great classes. Um, it was a new newer building obviously so we were really proud of it and a lot of the city schools would come up and be like oh we're going to the college campus because it looked like a college campus Mm because it was such a modern school and um, and we had a good sports program we had a lot of people that were really vested within the community that really supported the the high school and it um, it was a a great a great uh, place to go to high school okay so it sounds like um, there was a lot of support for girls sports Mm -hmm. as well as boys sports. absolutely yeah I think that that part of New Jersey was really progressive and it was kind of interesting because that was most of our moms were pre title nine which Mm -hmm. you know so a lot of those women did not get to really participate in a lot of team sports you know if you came from an affluent family you could probably play golf or tennis Um, But when it came to team sports, there really wasn't a lot of funding for women. So my mom didn't really have the opportunity, even though she loved sports, she didn't have the opportunity to play sports. And plus, she grew up on a dairy farm, so she had to go home. She had to milk the cows before school. She had to milk the cows after school. So so she didn't really have that opportunity. So she was very determined to make sure that her daughters had the opportunity to play sports should they want to. And I think a lot of women in that area basically were like that because it was such a rural area. Those women knew that um, they didn't have the opportunities. um, They had to work for their families. And then once um, they you know, got married and had children, they wanted to make sure that there was opportunities for their daughters that they didn't have. So I think that that really was one of the driving forces within um, that part of Hunterdon County, New Jersey. It was kind of, for that time, pretty progressive to, um, to have that mindset because a lot of areas back in the mid to early 80s were not as um, progressive thinking. Title IX was only about 10 years old, so it really hadn't gotten all the leverage that it has nowadays. and. Um, so I was very, I'm very grateful for the women in that area that they were that like-minded and progressive to really help girls have the opportunity to play sports. Mm-hmm. Did you have any teachers or coaches who had a particular influence on you? Yeah, my, my high school coach, Donna Exley, she was a physical education coach at Voorhees High School. Um, she was a big part of it. I had some other grammar school coaches that were, excuse me, grammar school teachers that were not coaches but just great women who inspired me and you know knew that I love sports so they would you know encourage me to to go out and play during the recreation or during the lunch breaks Um, because you know a lot of girls didn't really play together so if you were a girl and you were active you had to play with the boys and then there was a certain amount of stigma where the girls would make fun of you for playing with the boys and you know it was just one of those things when you're growing up Um, so the teachers when I was in grammar school were great about being like look if you like to play sports go out and run around and play sports I probably knew I listened better in class when I came back tired instead of squirming in my seat or whatever but uh, (laughs) um, so I had a lot of support, I would say, from a, the administration and from the teachers throughout my entire education in New Jersey. That's good. So there, there was still that that stigma with some of the kids. Oh yeah, yeah. definitely. In fact, um, I think when I was in fourth grade, I was playing football during the lunch break, <clears throat> and I broke my wrist. And I didn't know at the time I had broke my wrist. I came in from lunch break, and I was sitting at my desk, and I, my arm was really hurting me, and I was kind of crying a little bit, and. Some of the other girls, they were so mean. They're like, see, that's what you get for playing with the boys and, you know, all that type of stuff. So instead of being like, oh, what's wrong, you know, it was the whole, well, you shouldn't be playing with the boys, which I think nowadays, you know, kids start playing t-ball. It's boys and girls. They don't really, they don't separate them because I think they realize nowadays that none of that stuff matters. Just get the kids moving and playing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I understand you you started pitching when you were in high school. What brought that about? 
Well, my father had um, an illness called Crohn's disease, and he actually had some time off of work because he had some surgery. And while he had um, a month or two off of work, he was home. He was reading in the paper about a women's softball, ma women's major fast pitch softball league games that were going on up in Parsippany, New Jersey. And there was a team called the Budweiser Bells, and they were playing the Linden Majors. And uh, he just decided that he was going to take me up to, um, to some of the games to see you know, what the women look like as far as their sports and playing. And my father, when, uh, when he worked for Public Service Electric and Gas, he played on their fast pitch softball team. A lot of times teams, uh, companies had industrial, you know, teams and leagues that played. And there was a lot more sports or corporate recreation, I would say, back, you know, in the 70s and 80s than there is nowadays. So um, he knew a lot about fast pitch softball, and he decided it would be a good you know, be a good. Ro these would be good role models for me to go up and see. Um, and so I went up and watched the game between the two teams in Parsippany, New Jersey, with him. And uh, we got talking to the coach of the team out of Linden, New Jersey, and a uh, really great lady. Her name was Betty Zwingraff, and um, she. By this time, it was my freshman year in high school, and I was, you know, big kid, tall, left-handed, and decent athlete and she said well you know if your daughter's interested in in playing ball just come down and practice with the team you know come down and just practice with the team we'll help her out as much as we can and she'll you know see what she, see if she enjoys it and and so that was my um, my freshman year in high school and I would go down on on the weekends my dad would drive me down to uh, to Parsippany actually is where the team practiced even though they were out of Linden they would practice at Rutgers University in Parsippany New Jersey uh, and um, I would play with them. I would, you know, run around at practices, and it was great for me because it really made me see the level of talent of women that were out there. But I guess once they saw the athletic ability that I had, Betty decided that over that winter between my freshman and sophomore year, um, I guess she was kind of conspiring behind my back with some of the other athletes that they were going to teach me how to pitch, you know. <laughs> and I didn't know what was going on. I just, you know, they would come up to me and be like, some of the players would come up and be like, now Michelle, just listen to Betty and have an open mind, you know. And I'd be like, huh, what are you talking about? And then someone else would come up and be like, you know, you're a good athlete, so if Betty wants to work with you on some stuff, you should really, you know, you should listen to her. I'm like, huh, what are you talking about? Of course I'm going to listen to her. So I didn't realize what they were doing. They were kind of like uh, getting me ready for the, hey, Michelle, do you want to try to pitch <laughs> question. And um, so Betty was like, you know, Michelle, I think there's an opportunity for me to, to see if, if you, you could pitch. You're left-handed, you're tall, you've got long arms, and you're athletic, so let's see if, if, you know, see if we could possibly teach you how to pitch. So uh, in the fall of my sophomore year, on uh, one of the weekends, she gave me a lesson and said, you know, let's go ahead and try it. My dad remembers when he tells the stories, he was sitting up in the stand reading his paper, you know, and every once in a while he'd drop the paper and he'd look and he'd be like, oh, you know, he'd be like, oh, and be like, oh, it's not going too well. Like, oh, the kid's probably not going to work out. And I guess at the end of the lesson, Betty went up and said to, to, to my dad that she's got a lot of natural talent, and if she really, if she works hard for the next three years, there's a really good chance she could get a scholarship to college. So um, my dad was really surprised, and I didn't know what I was doing. I was just enjoying it. I was like, oh, this is a challenge. <laughs> you know, let's see, see what happens. And um, that's kind of how it started. But Betty Zwingraff was my first pitching coach, and she's the one that really got me started pitching. And so my first actual year pitching um, competitively was my sophomore year in high school. And how did your teams, how did your high school teams do? My sophomore year, we made it to, um, we made it to just before state, so we actually did really well. Um, at first, you know, I started off a little slow, but as the season went on and I got comfortable, um, we ended up having a really good year. We won, the, I think we won the conference and we won um, our local district, and then we lost like in the, the semifinals, I guess you would say, of, of the states. Um, my junior year, we ended up winning the whole state championship, and um, my, my senior year, I think we lost in districts again. We lost uh, some of our better field athletes uh, and my catcher. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, that's always hard when you lose your catcher. No, I was going to say, not the catcher, because <laughs> yeah. that's, that's an important <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Now, um, were, were you on other teams in high school, too? I mean, church leagues or yes, I travel can, teams? Yes, I continued to... Um, not as much play on the church league because I got to then to the point where I was almost too competitive for the, the for the church league. So um, that became more recreational. But then it was high school, and then I I started to play for that team called the Linden Majors. So then during the summers, after my high school season was over, 
I would be playing with this women's major fast pitch team where all the women were either in college or out of college. So I was a good five to eight years younger than a lot of the athletes that I was playing with. So it was, it was kind of sink or swim. I mean, it was very competitive for me and I was very raw and, but it was probably the best thing for me because it really, it made me have to play up to their level. And a lot of times kids aren't challenged enough nowadays. And for me, I was challenged right from the beginning. There was, you know, you couldn't even take a pitch off because at that point I was afraid I was going to get killed. <laughs> you know, throwing, a, throwing pitching against some of these women who were on the U.S. national team and had international experience, had already played their four years of college and just were phenomenal athletes, you know. And here I was, a little, you know, 17, 18 year old or playing against them. I was like, whoa. <laughs> it was. It was nerve-wracking at times, but it was great. It definitely helped add to my um, my career and, and my talents. Well, a, real, a real trial by fire. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> trial by fire, exactly. Iron forges iron. So. <laughs> well, I understand that um, you set a number of records in high school. Do yeah. you want to talk a little bit about those? Um, I don't remember all of what they are, but, yeah, I think I threw, like, a certain number of no-hitters or um, – stuff like that at home I think even I had some home run records and stuff like that but I don't I never really was big at keeping my stats or looking at my numbers for me I was always more forward looking statistics are usually backward looking so I like to um, and if I did look at my statistics to just kind of judge how I was hitting um, a lot of times I would just look at my last 10 at bats and I'd be like all right if I was you know three for ten or four for ten or five for ten I knew I was doing good if I was dropping you know, three for ten and below, I was not real happy about that. I knew I was needed to start working on some things. but um, So I wasn't a real big statistics person. I think I was more about um, knowing who my opponent was, what was going to be my next uh, my next challenge. Mm -hmm. Doing your homework and being exactly, prepared. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I'm more forward looking. Because again, I think too many people get stuck on their statistics and it's all, statistics are all about what you did. Mm -hmm doesn't mean it's what you're going to do. Well, and that's that's how you get the belief in curses and slumps and yes, exactly. So, now in my interviews over the years, I I, I realized in high school you were playing field hockey uh -huh. and basketball too. I've had a lot of athletes and coaches talk about this growing specialization um, right. with with high school athletes, right. both with sports, a particular sport, but also a particular position in a sport rather right. than trying out a bunch of things. Correct. Uh -huh. um, were you starting to see any of that when you were in high school? Um, there was some of that. It was just really starting. There were some um, softball players in some of the different city uh, areas or schools that we played against that were just started, starting to specifically play softball. They play their high school season, they play travel ball during the summers, and then they would work out with that team. Um, all went fall and winter long and they decided not to play other sports. For me, I didn't like to take that route because I, I and it's still my belief that um, when you play other sports, you're developing your whole athletic demeanor. You're not just focusing on one thing. And I think that's why we're also seeing a lot of kids have major injuries nowadays or overuse injuries because it's so repetitive. They're doing only one thing instead of Whereas field hockey, you might be working um, your legs more, and basketball, your legs more. Whereas uh, maybe softball, baseball, it's a lot more upper body. So there's, you know, you have that balance, and I think everything in life is about balance. Plus, the other thing is that it keeps you motivated and hungry to want to get back on on the field. You know, if you're really passionate about something, if you spend too much time doing it, there, to a point, sometimes that passion can kind of wean and wear out, and you start to focus on the wrong things. Um, don't take me wrong. I mean, when I first started to pitch, because I started so late, I pitched after field hockey practice. I would practice and pitch after basketball practice. Um, so I didn't just quit everything else to focus on pitching. I did other things and played other sports and then still found time in my schedule to pitch because I knew I needed you know, that improvement. So I think that specializing to a point is okay, but I, I just I think sometimes we take that overboard. Yeah, because some coaches I've talked to have um, mentioned that they get kids who, even in their freshman year of college, are just burnt out on the sport. Oh, absolutely. Because they've been, there's been yeah. so much pressure. So much pressure, and a lot of kids, a lot of that younger generation right now, all they're doing is focusing on getting the scholarship, and that's their goal. And once they get that scholarship, then they get to college, and they're like, you know, they're mush. They're mental mud, and, you know, they just don't have that drive anymore because they've reached their goal. Instead of saying, okay... I want to win a college national championship, then, you know, and dial it back from there at the end of their four years, or, you know what I'm saying? The, the right now, their goal is at the beginning of their college 
their four years. So it takes a special athlete to continue to be motivated. Um, and we do see that with a lot of kids. They're young, they're burnout, they're overused, uh, and they just don't have that zest or that fire when they get to college. And a lot of college coaches are going, what, what happened? I recruited this kid that was so passionate and had so much energy, and now they're just, you know, burnout. Plus, I think, too, the, you know, your freshman year in college is just a, is a very – challenging time for anybody because all of a sudden you're out of your comfort zone you're living away from you know your family everything is a new experience every single day is new so your brain is working overtime it's not in that comfort zone anymore which consumes a, a small amount of energy you're now in that part of your brain where everything is new so it consumes a lot of energy and I remember my freshman year in college I was exhausted I slept if I had 30 minutes in between class I was sleeping for 20 of them I mean I was exhausted between and it wasn't just I was exhausted because I was playing, you know, a Division One sport. I was exhausted because I think I was had to think so much. Everything was new. Okay, ha wait, where's that classroom? Oh, that's right, it's over here. And then, oh wait, and what's my schedule? I have softball practice. And then, oh wait, I need to make it back to eat in time. But you know, so everything is a learning. Everything took a great amount of mental um, energy. You couldn't be on autopilot. Absolutely, exactly. Yeah. Well, speaking of college, how did you end up getting to OSU? Well, um, that's a really good question. I went to a um, I went to a summer camp out in the Poconos that was put on by at the time one of the best pitchers in the country. Her name was Kathy Aronson, and she brought in some college coaches. One of the college coaches was uh, Margaret Rebinar, who was the assistant coach at Oklahoma State for quite a few years. And um, I had known of Oklahoma State because there was actually another athlete from New Jersey who had gone there. Her name was Liz O'Connor, and she played there f the four, three or four years prior to when I went to, uh, to Oklahoma State. So she was done by the time I finally got there. Um, so I had known about it, and there was also a magazine publication that put out like the top 20 programs in the country, and Oklahoma State was, was one of those. And I don't know, something about the school just kind of caught my eye, and when Coach Rebinar was at this um, the summer camp, and I got to meet her. I, you know, I, I really enjoyed talking to her, and then I started to talk to Sandy Fisher, the head coach. And um, but I think the biggest reason I ended up choosing choosing um, Oklahoma State was of all the other universities that were recruiting me. And I think I had like something like 60 offers at the time. I mean, I was recruited by almost every major school in the country at the time. Um, and the thing I loved about Oklahoma State was just Stillwater and the people and the environment. Um, it was a lot like where I grew up in New Jersey. It was. Uh, it was a country town, you know, built around a, a university, and I just loved the feel of it, and uh, I just felt at home. And like my parents said, when I got off the plane from my recruiting trip, they said I had the biggest smile on my face, <laughs> you know. Where all the other schools that I went and looked at, it was a little bit different. I went out to um, California and looked at Cal State Fullerton, and, you know, for me, Southern California was just too big, too busy, too many people. I wanted to go to that environment where it was a college town. I knew that about myself, that I love that that country, that college town type of feel, and um, so it was probably, those were the main factors. Both Sandy and Margaret were pitchers, and I knew I needed a lot of help on the field, and then the university itself, and the environment, and the people were just awesome. It's, it's quite, a, yeah. quite a place. Yeah. yeah. Um, what were your first impressions of women's athletics when you got to OSU as um, an overall? My overall first impression was that uh, I don't think we were one of the school, like one of the top schools in the country, as far as like budgets and and funding and all that stuff. But that's Oklahoma. That was Oklahoma State in general at the time. In the Big Eight, I think we had the most Big Eight championships of all the other seven schools combined, and we I think we had one of the lowest budgets. So to me, that told of the type of athlete that went there. That blue collar. I don't have to have all the bells and whistles to win, um, which was a lot how I was. You know, it's kind of that. Um, that mentality of an athlete who's more concerned about what they're doing and what they're representing than what they're wearing, um, you know, or how good they look, all that type of stuff. So, so I knew that um, I knew that it wasn't going to be easy. I knew that we weren't going to be the, the most, the best funded, or have the best stadium, or anything like that. In fact, a lot of the universities didn't have stadiums. We did have our own field on campus, which was big because. At the time, Oklahoma didn't even have their own field on campus. They played on uh, Parks and Rec fields just um, off campus. So so there were some areas where we were um, ahead of a lot of other institutions, but there were other areas where we, we didn't quite have the budget. So Oklahoma, maybe their uniforms were nicer than ours, but we had a field on campus, you know. So, you know, there was always that give and take. Um, the other thing that was really great about Oklahoma State at the time, too, was that Gallagher-Iba um, Arena had the lower 
basement area where we could practice inside. Where, you know, again, back in the 80s, a lot of institutions did not really have indoor facilities for, you know, outdoor sports. And so even though it wasn't the best facility and it was a little dusty and dingy down there, <laughs> we spent a lot of time down in that environment, um, you know, practicing in inclement weather days or, or during the winter. Um, but I think that one of the things that did change is that um, the, the, the coaches of the, the women's um, teams, I think, were constantly kind of pushing the university to, to do more for the women, to stay involved, um, to not forget about us. Um, did as much as they could. I remember some of the years we wore leftover women's basketball uniforms. You know, that's how I got to be number 52. People are like, 52? How are you number 52? I was like, well, I handed down basketball uniforms and now there was no seven in basketball. I wanted to be seven, <laughs> but there's no seven in basketball, so five and two is seven, so that's how I ended up picking 52. Um, but so it's kind of funny. There's some some good stories, but overall, I mean, it was a, it was a great experience. Mm -hmm. Now you meant you mentioned Sandy Fisher. And yeah, she was your coach the entire time. Correct. You were uh -huh. at OSU. Well, what kind of coach was she? Sandy was a good coach. She was, um, you know, I think that she uh, was progressive in the sense that she did as much as she could. She learned as much as she could to try to help us um, on and off the field. I think that. Sandy and Margaret, during the times that I was there, they were a great combination in the sense that Margaret was kind of the, the jokester, was kind of easygoing, and Sandy was a little more stern. And you got to have that. You got to have like a good cop, bad cop type of, um, you know, attitude feel in the staff to really keep keep things light and people relaxed because, you know, obviously in any environment people are going to do better when they're relaxed and enjoying themselves, but you have to learn to work hard too. So there's that fine line of you can't stray too far to the left or to the right. Um, but Sandy was really good. I mean, I, I enjoyed the fact, I think I enjoyed her more afterward, you know, like any athlete does. You, you, you look back and you, you realize how special your coaches were more after you're done than while you're in the environment a lot of times because you end up focusing on the wrong things and, you know, you're young. So you don't always appreciate things the way that you should. Um, the thing, the big, biggest thing I got from both of the Sandy and Margaret is how much they worked with us, um, and how much they worked with me individually. Because again, I was very raw. I'd only been pitching for three years when I got there, and um, Sandy was very supportive of me even through my accident. You know, they said that they were going to make sure that I was rehabbed um, the way I needed to be rehabbed, and they weren't going to give up on me. They weren't going to, you know didn't have to worry about my scholarship or any of that stuff, which were, you know, at the time as a 19-year-old, those are all major concerns. And mm -hmm. Well, since, since you brought that up, why don't we talk a little bit about your accident? Mm -hmm. Could you give yep. some background on what happened? Yeah, my, um, in between my freshman and sophomore year in college, I went back to New Jersey and I was working um, with my father at Public Service Electric and Gas. Um, so they had this summer employment program, so I would go out and work with the guys, and it was it was fun. I would dig ditches and jackhammer, and it was, it was a great summer job, made really good money, worked really hard, kept me in good shape to go back to, to school. I was also playing ball um, at the time as well, so I was kind of burning the candle at both ends, and um, I, was, I was tired. I, and and I, at the time, I had impacted and infected wisdom teeth, so I had, was on my way back from a uh, oral surgeon's appointment. And um, on the way home, I got in a car accident. I fell out of the, the vehicle. I was, was moving. And um, of all the parts of my body that I ended up hurting, I ended up hitting um, a post um, on the side of the road, and, and I hit my elbow. And it lacerated. It opened up my elbow. It chopped my part of my bone off, my, the olecranon process, and ripped my tricep off the attachment. So it was a pretty, pretty nasty injury. And um, being way out in the country, my dad got me loaded back up in the car and drove me to the hospital, which was about 30 minutes away, and uh, went in and had emergency surgery. And my arm was just such a mess that they, you know, the doctors didn't think I would probably ever pitch again because my ulnar nerve was exposed, my muscle had been ripped off the attachment, I had gravel and dirt and debris in my bone, and they spent, you know, two hours in surgery just kind of trying to clean it up to make sure it wouldn't get infected. The big thing they thought is that if I can get through the next 48 hours without having an infection, then that was going to be one of the major hurdles to cross. So they pumped me full of all sorts of uh, antibiotics to try to keep me and keep my arm from, from getting infected. They sewed the muscle back down uh, onto the bone and closed it up and put me in a straight arm cast. And uh, 
I would go back and see the doctor every week and uh, once he felt like there was enough um, enough of the muscle was starting to adhere to the bone he would then try to bend my arm a little bit so I went from being straight because you know they knew if they kept it straight too long it would be frozen I'd never be able to bend my arm again so every week he would bend it um, just a little bit and and even just after a couple weeks he he would have to push on the cast with all his might just to try and bend my arm to get in that position and uh, that was probably the most painful part of the accident was just trying to to get that range of motion and so by the time I went back, this was in the middle, end of the middle of July, it was um, July 21st, uh, 1985, uh, 86, excuse me, July 21st, 1986 was the date of the accident. So by the time I went back to school in September, I was in a, in a cast that was kind of bent. And uh, the, the training staff at Oklahoma State was great. They worked with me every single day, I mean, seven days a week. I think one day I didn't show up on a Sunday, and I got in big trouble for that <laughs> later on in the fall. But I literally worked every single day um, to rehab it, to try and get it back. And um, the, I think the, the hardest part, again, was once I, uh, you know, I got through that phase, I didn't have the infection, it looked like it was healing. Uh, and once I started to rehab, then the big question was when I was out of that cast, I could only move my arm about, you know, 10 to 15 degrees. So we had to try to get that range of motion back, and that was, that was by far the most painful thing. And we would, the trainers would just work me from cold whirlpool to hot whirlpool to cold whirlpool, just doing anything, massaging it, just bending my arm manually, just moving it as much as I could to get as much range of motion back as possible. And, and that was extremely, extremely painful. Um, so that's what we did most of all fall. And then once we got my range of motion back, then it was time to try to start to build the muscle back because my arm was so atrophied at this point. It was just, you know, you looked at it and you thought, okay, how are you ever going to be able to pitch again <laughs> with that? And, you know, and then that's when I started thinking, well, maybe the doctors were right and that I, I would possibly never pitch again. Um, but for me, the big decision came down to the fact that um, if I wasn't going to be able to pitch, I was going to prove that that was going to be a decision I was going to make. It wasn't going to be because a doctor told me I was going to, you know, push it as much as I could and then if it didn't work out, it didn't work out. So I, um, I got through that range of motion. We started building my, my arm back. I finally got some, um, some muscle back on my arm, which was, you know, that in itself was, was a lot of hard work because I couldn't even bend my arm. They, the trainers would put my arm over my head and say, okay, straighten your arm up. And I couldn't even do that on my own, just against gravity. You know, they'd push it and get it started. And once it got started, I would, I would be able to, you know, to rep out, you know, 10, mm -hmm. 10 reps of maybe two or three sets. But, um, but it was very difficult. And then once I could move on my own strength against gravity, they gave me that little one pound weight. <laughs> and that was so depressing, holding this little one pound weight and being like, you know, struggling to get that up. But then one pound went to two and went to four and eight and, and 10. So I, the muscle actually came back pretty quick. I mean, within, you know, three weeks or so, my arm was, three weeks to a month, my arm was pretty built up. And and it was good. So then, you know, now we're toward Christmas break, and now it's time to, to figure out, okay, can, can I actually pitch? And when I first started to pitch, I'd throw five, ten pitches, and my hand would go numb because that ulnar nerve was exposed. There was still a lot of swelling in there, and, and that's when I started to doubt if I'd ever really be able to pitch again because I just thought, well, maybe there's just that too much nerve damage. And, um, and that was hard because that was very frustrating to have done all that work and then start to try to pitch again and, and then not be able to fill my hand. And I, I got to the point where I just I couldn't even hold the ball. The ball would just drop out of my hand. But I continued to take my anti-inflammatories and ice and do the, the rehab and the massage. And eventually, you know, 5 and 10 pitches went to 15 and 20 and then 25 to 30 and, you know, 30 to 40 to 50. And, and I start to be able to throw, throw more and more. And I think once those um, anti-inflammatories really continued to kick in and I took those steadily, it, it got that swelling out of there, it took some pressure off that ulnar nerve. And before you knew it, I was back playing um, my sophomore year, so I didn't even redshirt a year. And I think Sandy and Margaret were going to redshirt me a year, but our senior pit our senior pitcher at the time um, blew out her ankle like one of the first or second games of the season. So we had nobody else really to pitch but me. So there was no opportunity really to redshirt me. So I ended up actually coming back and throwing the ball three miles an hour harder after the accident than before, which is crazy to think that. But I mean, that's how how hard I worked year round. Or, or since July, just to be able to get my, you know, to get my strength back and 
then I really had to work on my form and make sure that my mechanics were pure. So in a way, you know, the, the biggest thing I talk about it now when I do motivational spe speeches, I, you know, I talk about the fact that that accident, as terrible as it was in so many ways, it was actually a blessing because it taught me a lot of stuff. It taught me to work hard. It taught me that um, to value pitching, um, but it also taught me the most important thing that a lot of athletes don't figure out is that pitching was what I did. It wasn't who I was, and a lot of kids learn that their identity is who they are, is what they do as an athlete, and that's simply not true. So at 19, I was blessed in the sense that I figured out really early in life that pitching was what I did. It wasn't who I was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, that must have been incredibly scary. You know? It was. It was. Because at, at 19, when the doctor's sitting there saying, you're never going to pitch again, you go, oh, my God, what am I going to do with my life now? You know, what, I, I mean, at least you had four years planned out. You were going to have a scholarship. You're going to play ball. You're going to get your education. You, okay, you can't, you're not going to pitch anymore. All of a sudden, well, you know, at 19, what, do you, what, what am I going to do? You know, mm -hmm. so it was baby steps you know to get back but definitely when I look back over my the entire span of my career um, it was one of the things that I think that really propelled me onto greatness do you do you think your mechanics changed any because of it or, um, or was it just all the work for yeah rehab that's a that good question actually I, I'm sure they did I'm sure I had to focus a little bit more on my legs on using my body more efficiently I mean I had always done that anyway because my you know, Betty Zwingraff my first pitching coach was very adamant about, you know, as a woman, you've got to use your legs, it's the strongest part of your body, you've got to really drive well off the rubber, understand your hip angle. And I studied as well. I was, um, I loved physics and science, you know, so I took all those courses in, in high school even while I was first learning to pitch because I knew it was going to help me um, understand the pitching motion. And then I was at Oklahoma State, I was st continuing to study more in the um, uh, movement sciences, biomechanics, health, wellness, all that type of field um, and then I decided you know I was kind of going more toward pre-med toward my junior and senior year uh, at Oklahoma State University which was a little bit late but then I started all my pre excuse me all my electives I started taking like physics and different things like that that I could take to you know so I knew I was a little bit behind if I wanted to go to medical school I was still gonna have to take some extra courses after I left um, Oklahoma State but I knew that those were gonna help me as well so I think the big thing is is that yes um, it helped me focus more on my mechanics um, and it probably helped me realize even more so that okay you know you need to do that from a performance standpoint, but I needed to do it from a pain standpoint as well because if I didn't throw right, I mean, it hurt me. It physically would hurt me if I, my arm was in a bad position. Um, and the same thing with hitting. But I, it, it actually hurt me more to hit than it did to pitch. That's what I was going to ask because yeah. of the impact. That because you, of the impact yeah. and the extension and because mm -hmm. I never got that full extension back. I mean, my arm to this day does not straighten, you know, like my other arm does, and it doesn't bend all the way. So, um, and it's still really really crunchy <laughs> still a lot of stuff in there but you know I got it to where I needed it to be and then I learned to basically hit and I think I built up the muscle around it enough so that my arm wasn't constantly being slammed into that position of a uh, range of motion where it was painful mm -hmm. um, which yeah, is what you, you found getting that hyper extension exactly yeah. exactly so yeah. well I guess let's um, go back and, and talk about the coaches again okay because you were talking about how supportive they were yes um, how, between Sandy and Margaret, how did they motivate players? Um, boy, that's a good question. How did they motivate players? I think in a, in a couple of different ways. I think, again, I think that um, Margaret was more of the laughter, joking, you know, enjoy yourself, kind of have fun, put a smile on your face, and you're going to relax, and that will motivate you and, and allow you to play play better because you're just, you're relaxed, you're not, uh, you know, over tense in the moment. Sandy, I think it was more about pride, institutional representation, um, you know, do it for your team, your neighbor, yourself, um, pride of the program, you know, of the cowgirls of, you know, just representing Oklahoma State University. I think the other thing, too, is that you just, when you're in college, you just have that natural drive to, you know, want to beat Oklahoma or want to beat, um, you know, Kansas or whoever, Missouri, whoever your, your rival is for the day. Um, but I think a lot of it, though, too, that they did a good job with is they motivated us to, uh, to be our best on the field. So not just to, to be satisfied with the status quo, to continue to strive to be better, to understand that my freshman class that came in, we had a lot of new players. I think we had nine new players that year. I think we had 
seven freshmen and maybe two junior college transfers. So we were like a whole new team. I mean, we spent lots of time practicing, learning the program, learning the drills, learning everything about what Oklahoma State softball was at the time. Um, and I think so that in itself motivated us to really come together and be a team that um, knew that we had the talent to be good. We knew that we had a special group of people together and we hadn't been, Oklahoma State hadn't been to the College World Series, um, but we knew that we were that group of, core group of people that could kind of get us over that, over that hump to get mm -hmm. us to the, to the championships. Now, you mentioned a minute ago uh, rivals. Mm -hmm. uh, for OSU softball, besides OU, of course, yeah. what, who were the major rivals during the years you were there? Um, boy, let's see. Who would that be? It would probably, the two biggest ones would probably be Oklahoma and Nebraska. Nebraska was a very good program back in the 80s. In fact, in 80, my first year was 86. In 85, they played in the national championship game. Lori Sippel was their um, pitcher. She was a Canadian, and she was very talented, and we battled for three years against each other. So I would, they, I would definitely say Nebraska because they were just amazing. But also um, Kansas was very good. Missouri was good. I mean, the, the Big Eight back then at the time had a lot of strength. Um, well, it's that Midwestern softball mm -hmm, mm -hmm. ethic, I think. Yeah, and then of course, with outside of the Big Eight, you had Texas A&M, who had won national championships, who were very strong. And then of course, all the California teams that have always predominantly been been very good programs. So I think that um, there was a lot of rival, obviously, within the Big Eight, but then I would say that it was Texas A&M, and um, there weren't a lot of SEC schools, obviously. I think back then it was like basically South Carolina, Florida State had a good team, but the SEC was not yet developed uh, for mm -hmm. softball. So. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you mentioned some of the other women that were on the team with mm -hmm. you. Um, have you stayed in touch over the years? I, on and off, I do. Mm -hmm. I'll hear from them. The, the person I've probably stayed in touch with the most is Lisa Harvey, who is my catcher. Mm -hmm. um, and, and she went into umpiring afterwards, so we actually talk a lot while I'm commentating for ESPN. If I have questions, I'll call her and be like, Harv, what does this mean? <laughs> you know, because and being a catcher, she was awesome. I mean, I, I have to credit her with a lot of the successes I had. At Oklahoma State was really because of her. She was a phenomenal catcher. Um, Sherry Johnson was an amazing shortstop. Um, she just was outstanding um, playing playing behind me. Um, Sharon Sedano at third base, awesome as well. She was from California. She ended up going to medical school herself. Um, but uh, Deb Mobius, who was at first base, <coughs> excuse me. She was from California, another great athlete, great person. We just had a lot of really good people on the team. And um, yeah, Laura Dodrell was one of the junior college transfers who came in, and she was, uh, she was the jokester of the team, you could say. Yeah, she really uh, she did a lot. So she was, she was fun my, our, our freshman and sophomore year, and then she was done after that. Now, um, what, what were the facilities like? when you started out there? Um, well, basically the field is the same field that's there now. There just wasn't the stadium aspect behind it. I think we had um, a decent set of bleachers and a press box behind home plate, um, but it was the same location right behind the baseball field. So <laughs> the, the guys, some of the big hitters would, would get up and brrr, the, you know, the home runs would come flying onto our field. You, you could hear if the crowd started cheering really loud, you were like, okay, heads up. <laughs> Incoming. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Incoming baseball. Um, so, uh, so the facilities actually at the, at the time were, were good. I mean, and the fact that we had a uh, field on campus was, was, was really, in, in that sense, um, pretty progressive. I mean, a lot of other institutions did as well, but the fact that we had a, 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 a lit field on campus was, was big. Yeah. Did you have a separate locker room? Or? We did not have locker rooms, okay. though. That was one of the things we did not have. So we would always dress at our apartments or wherever and then, and then come over. We had a shed. Um, just down for our storage. Um, There's a bathroom behind the press box. But as far as lockers were concerned, no, we never really had anything like that. And, you know, the weight room back at the time was not really great. There, was, there were a couple of small weight rooms. Now, they did build, I think it was either my sophomore year, they built that big weight room that was off the end of the, the football um, stadium with the training room upstairs, which was nice. That really made a big difference. Okay, yeah, because I was going to ask, um, was there a lot of competition with the guys for some of the facilities? <clears throat> yeah, definitely there was. So the, the, the pit 
underneath um, the basketball arena, we were always having to compete with, of course, baseball. And there was a track, there was a track around there. Most of the track athletes didn't run down there because it just wasn't a very healthy environment with all that dirt in the air. But, um, but we were constantly having to compete for time there in the pit. And then, of course, the weight room, um, trying to get in the weight room. But, but they always found a way to fit us in. I mean, it wasn't, I, I never felt like we didn't have what we needed. Mm -hmm. you know, there it was might have been a, early in the morning. Yes, exactly. There was always a way to try to make to make it work and then the training facilities were great doc fair um he was awesome he really had a great staff that took care of everybody and again i you know i have to to thank all of them for their hard work to help get me back um through my injury i mean that really you know saved my career sounds like they had a really good team as yes. far as the trainers and, and, and they were committed medical. you know and for them to come in on weekends you know to work with me that was that was big that's a big commitment mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, when you mentioned that they missed you on a Sunday, I'm thinking, yeah, wow, that means they were there over exactly. the weekend. Exactly. So, um, what, where were the other women's sports at that point? Um, women's basketball was a, um, I think, as far as in the Big Eight, was an average team. I don't think we were. I think we were mid or to lower part of the league. Um, I had thought about playing basketball my fifth year, actually, once I was done playing softball, but I didn't for a number of reasons. Um, and then, you know, we didn't have women's soccer back then. Um, there was a couple of track and field athletes. Now that the programs, the individual sports, but the tennis and golf, there were some very good tennis and golfers who came through um, Oklahoma State while I was there. So that was impressive mm -hmm. as well. And where were they housed in terms of the facilities? Were they, I mean, um, were the other women's <clears throat> sports, were they all? Well, basketball would play in Gallagher Iba mm -hmm. Arena. Um, the track and field was at the, I guess it's the same track and field that's, you know, up the road there across from the, the student housing. Um, other than that, I mean, there, we didn't really have a lot of women's programs. We didn't have volleyball. We didn't have soccer. So we didn't have a lot of the sports that you find at other institutions. But, um, you know, I think that was one of the things about Oklahoma State when we talked earlier about those budgetary concerns, one of the smallest budgets in the Big Eight, but yet the most amount of titles. I mean, a lot of that came from wrestling and the strength of the men's golf and, and, um, and the women's golf and tennis, um, softball had done well. So, you know, I think we had some core group of sports that really helped bring a lot of athletic su success to, uh, to Stillwater, to Oklahoma State University. Mm -hmm. I was trying to get a sense, too, of how often you got to be in contact with other female athletes besides your yeah. team, because sometimes softball, because yeah. you're at a different facility. Right. Not a whole lot. I mean, the, yeah. the our, our greatest amount of contact would have been with the women's basketball team because of the location of the weight room and the locker, uh, not the locker room, the um, training room being close to Gallagher Iba. That's where we would see a lot of those other athletes. And then just knowing them from student housing as well. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, how many games a year did you usually, were you usually playing? We played, I would say 60, give or take. Mm -hmm. um, a year was probably a pretty average number. Okay. Did games. you have a fall season? We did have a fall season, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we would have, I would say, 10 to 20 games in the fall, depending on the weather and if we traveled. Mm -hmm. I think a couple of years we went to a tournament in uh, maybe somewhere in Missouri, and we would play a lot of games. But we also had a tournament ourselves in the fall. Fall ball was always great. You know, I love love the fall season. The beginning of it was not so much great because August when you came back and you're playing and starting to practice in a hundred and you know five hundred and ten degree heat, it was well, it could zap you. But that is inspiring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was tough. But it was good. So what would what would the year have looked like as far as um, when fall season started, when practices started? what you could mm -hmm. do in the off season. Yeah. We would normally have to get to Stillwater before the average student would because we would start practice, I think, maybe um, just before school started. So we were usually in a little bit early um, to start our training. And then we would start our fall season usually sometime in um, September, and that would go through like the end of October. So we had a pretty decent fall season. Back in, you know, the 80s, the NCAA gave you more leeway on the amount of time you could practice, which, you know, my freshman, sophomore year, we needed it because we had such a new team with so many new players. So that was a good thing. Um, 
once the fall season was over, then we went turned more into like weight training, individual training, um, that type of stuff, and more fundraising. We would do things to help fundraise for the for the program. Um, you know, focus on our studies, and then we would go home from um, go home for the uh, winter break for Christmas break, and then once we came back from Christmas break, it was full on. You know, getting ready for the spring season, which usually started. Uh, I think at the end of February, beginning of March, we would start to travel. Okay. Now, um, w was there a, did you have fall ball the whole four years? Yes, uh -huh, all okay. four years, which was, again, I think was really important because a lot of programs nowadays don't really even have that many fall games. I mean, we played a lot of fall games um, and we scrimmaged ourselves a lot. I mean, that was an important part of, I think, our progress. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you mentioned how many games a year you might have. How many of those were away? Was well, it about 50-50? I would say some. Well, it could actually even be more. It could almost be like 60% away, 40% home, or even, or even more. Um, because a lot of times you would play at tournaments, you know, and so you would travel. The first hall part of your season would be away to tournaments, and then the home games were mostly your big 12, excuse me, your big eight games. Um, as well as, you know, some midweek contests when some other programs from the Big Ten or different, you know, conferences would come in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <coughs> how, many, how many of those trips do you think would be tournaments on an average year? Um, I bet we went to um, a good th three or four tournaments a year. So we would go um, to probably two over spring break on the front side and the back side of spring break. We'd probably go to um, one trip out somewhere either to California or Arizona. I know we were in New Mexico some years, um, Houston some years. So we mostly stayed either to the further part of the southwest or we went west a lot of times. So that gave you an opportunity though to kind of get a sense of some of the other teams more than you might have during your regular season. Absolutely, yeah. We tried to play, and I thought Sandy and Margaret did a good job of scheduling us and getting us outside of the, the Big Eight. We didn't need to see Nebraska more. We didn't, you know, we didn't need to see those programs more. We needed to go down and play the better teams that were, we, you know, we were going to need to face in the postseason. Mm -hmm. Now, um, how many staff members did the softball team have when you were there? We just had the head coach, uh, Sandy Fisher, assistant coach, Margaret Rebinar, and I don't even think we had a, even a, a second assistant at the time. We might have um, had a little bit of manager help, but I don't even remember. I mean, it's definitely not like today where you'll have a head coach or two assistant coaches, a, a manager, and you know someone else to help take care of uh, all the different things. It was, it was pretty sparse. I mean, the head coaches were doing a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And, and you probably didn't, did you, I, I'm not sure what the setup was at OSU at the time, did you have trainers that were specified for we, softball? We had one trainer who okay. was with us for the season, correct. Okay. But then when we would go into the training room, there was a whole gamut of trainers who could help us. But yeah, we had one specific trainer who kind of helped head up everything. And Did that person with, travel with you? Yes, that person would travel okay. with us, yeah, so we did have that. Okay. Well, could you talk a little bit about the successes the OSU softball team had right. while you were there? Uh, I thought we, well, we had a lot of success. I mean, I think when I look back at some of the unfortunate things, my sophomore year when, um, you know, after he came back from the accident, uh, we ended up having a really good sophomore year, We, uh, which would have been the 87 season. Um, I think we were ranked in the top, we were in the top 20 all season long, and I think, uh, you know, we were in the top, 16 top 12 for there for a while and unfortunately toward the end of the season when they came to go to the postseason somehow we didn't get selected they normally would take like the top 16 teams and I think we were ranked you know 14th or something like that and we ended up not going it was kind of crazy it was very unfortunate that we ended up not going to the postseason my sophomore year that was that was very disappointing but um, we 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 turned that corner from that 1988 season, all of a sudden, you know, that sophomore year when um, we didn't make the postseason, we came back my junior year. It's like now ever all of us, that young group of, of athletes, we were now upperclassmen and we had some good freshmen that were coming in and 
and we ended up being ranked in the top five actually a lot my my junior year um, the 1988 season and I think we were ranked even number one at some points but in, unfortunately we lost in the postseason we didn't go to the college world series but we had a lot of successes we I think we won the the big big eight that year um, so we did really really well and then my senior year we I think we also did well in the big tw uh, excuse me the big eight ended up winning regionals we went to the college world series and i think we came in third my senior year okay so so were you getting a lot of support from the community and the campus while you yeah were definitely I, I remember at one point when we were ranked number one in the polls um i'm driving past a gas station it said cowgirl softball ranked number one in the country congratulations or something like that and i thought that was awesome i was like oh wow people are actually paying attention and you know we had decent um we had decent crowds. People would come out and, and watch the games, and I think a lot of people were vested in, in how well the, the program was doing. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I know you have a lot of individual honors, too, mm -hmm. that you received in college. Are there particular ones that you want to talk about? Or? The, the, well, the biggest ones I remember was being named All-American, I think, my junior and senior year, and, um, and some academic ones. So, yeah, I, you know, that's always great. I would have traded any of those to have won a national championship. But, you know, and I think the thing that unfortunately kept us from winning a national championship was um, that junior season when, when we lost in regionals and didn't make it to nationals. We didn't have that experience. So my senior year, we got to nationals. We did great. We came in third. But we didn't have that. Ex we did all of that without having any postseason experience, really. So if we would have gone to nationals, I think my junior year, if we would have actually made the College World Series on the junior year, I think there's a good chance we could have won everything our senior year because we would have had that experience, known what it felt like. Um, and you know, I have to say though, even back then, it wasn't the best playing environment. We played the College World Series out in Sunnyvale, California, and we played on these slow pitch fields that were so humped and rounded that it was, you know, it was crazy. So some of the places we played back you know back in the day are just crazy compared to nowadays we play in these beautiful stadiums and you know it's just it's so such a different level um so there's all those little things you look back and you think oh man it's unbelievable we used to play in that condition well just wrap, wrapping up the osu part mm -hmm. um how do you think being a student athlete at osu um affected your going going forward in the future. Well, I, I think it was a positive experience. I mean, most of the professors were very supportive of the fact that we did have to travel a lot and we were away a lot in the spring, but we got our work done and um, they uh, allowed us to be able to, you know, miss the classes we needed to miss. But you know, we also had to be there when we were in town. Um, so I think that the athletic department did a good job of saying okay, you're going to be able to miss these classes when you're away, but when you're in town, you, you better be at class, you know, and showing up and showing the professors that you're working hard uh, off the field, not just on the field. So um, there was a lot of support. Every once in a while, you'd have a professor who wasn't, you know, as supportive, and you'd have to do a little bit of extra work to try and get them to really help support you and support the athletic side of things. But uh, overall, I thought it was great. I mean, I... Um, I mean, I worked very hard for the four years that I was at Oklahoma State on and off the field, but I, th I think those are the things that make it great. I mean, you earn that degree, and um, I think as an athlete, you're just a little more focused. I didn't do a lot of the social stuff. I don't even think I ever went to one frat or sorority party because I just didn't have time. And even if I did have any extra time, I was probably exhausted and sleeping, <laughs> you know, because I was so tired from, from all the other stuff that we were doing. Okay, well, um, the last thing, I guess, uh, to talk about with your college years is just um, how aware were you as an undergraduate about Title IX issues and what was going on in that regard with OSU? Yeah. Um, honestly, I probably wasn't really aware of a whole lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I felt like, uh, I, I mean, I knew that um, Title IX existed, but I don't know that we ever looked at it looked at things with a skeptical eye and said, well, you know, if uh, the men's baseball is getting this, then we should get that, or, you know, there was never any of that type of stuff or any animosity. I think that, I think it wasn't until, you know, the 90s when all of a sudden people started to say, hey, wait a second, okay, are people truly following Title IX? It's not just that it's there, but are they compliant, you know? And, um, you know, I know that Sa the thing that I respected about Sandy is that she rocked the boat just enough. She knew she knew which fires, you know, to fight and what she really needed for the program. And that's where, as a coach, if you just go in and, you know, stir the pot all the time, you're going to create that animosity in the athletic, you know, 
departments, and you, you can't really have that. That's not good for anybody. Um, so I think Sandy was good at trying to push to get as much as she could, but then she knew her limit. You know, you can only get so much, and if it's just not there, it's not there. So um, not saying that it was perfectly fair ever, but, you know, life isn't fair, so you get what you can and you move on and do what you can with what you have. And um, I think that I think that that sums up the softball program pretty good. I think we did that. I think we did a really good job with what we had. Um, could we have done better? Absolutely. Could we have had more? Absolutely. But just because you have more doesn't mean you're going to be better, you know. Um, so awareness, definitely. Um, aware to be able to do something about it? Probably not so much. I think that really started to, to take place probably more so in the early 90s, early to mid 90s. Well, and the clarifications for Title IX were all in by then. Too. Yes. I think that was, <coughs> I think people were waiting on that to some degree. Too. Right. Um, with travel, I, I remember Sandy saying at one point that, you know, they, they went from having five girls in a room to four girls and then four to three or two. Mm -hmm. um, when you were, when you were there, um, what were the travel? I think it was four, four to a room. Mm -hmm. Um, if we, maybe more toward my junior and senior year, it might have gone three to two, but that could have been because we're upperclassmen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so you got, it's hard to tell from context. Yeah, exactly, you know? exactly. So, mm -hmm. but you know, back in the day when you grow up in an environment where you're used to that, it's not a big deal. I mean, the hardest part of having four women in the room would have been sharing the bathroom, you know, to get ready for games. And, you know, again, at least we're softball players, not cheerleaders, where we were, really weren't wearing makeup and didn't need a whole lot of mirror time, you know. <laughs> yeah, were, were, there, were there issues with visibility um, for either softball or women's sports generally with, with media? at that point. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's, I think we still battle that today. You know, if you look at a sports um, section of a newspaper, it's going to be like 90% men and 10% women or whatever the statistics are. I forget what they are, but they're very, very lopsided. Um, and, and that's part of the problem, in my opinion, of all of women's team sports is that we have, we have to educate the American public that it's just as fun to watch women's team sports as it is men's team sports because um, we go out and we support our men's programs, our men's professional teams, our men's college teams. Um, why do we not support our women's programs as much? Well, I think it's a couple of things. A, it's the exposure because we just, it's not in the forebrain because it's not in the newspapers, it's not as much on TV. I think uh, number two is we have to educate women to support women. You know, women are used to competing against women for the man, for, you know, for the husband, for the, um, in the corporate ladder, because there's only so many spots for women. So men support other men, men really well. Men will paint their face and go out and cheer for another man on a football field, you know, looking like a, you know, a goofball, <laughs> okay? Women don't support other women like that. And that's part of my opinion, part of the problem with, um, women's inability to really, really excel as much as men have. And you see it in, um, in the social, in business, and in sports. And I think we have to educate, A, the American people, but B, women to support other women. Mm -hmm. Now, let's get back to, I guess, what you did when you graduated from okay. college. Mm -hmm. um, after you graduated, you had a, well, you had a fifth year. I mean, so you finished with softball, but you had a fifth year. Correct. So I, I spent um, the fall part of my fifth year in Stillwater finishing up my classes and then the spring part of my fifth year I went up to the University of Oregon and I coached up there. So I was a, an assistant coach at the University of Oregon. I finished um, my internship at the hospital up there um, doing an uh, internship and so then I graduated in the spring of, of 90, mm -hmm. May of 90. And what was your what was your major? Um, I think it's technically labeled as health wellness. So I got a BS um, in health wellness, which was I think it was a very broad term back then. So it was either health education or health wellness. And um, health education would have been more of the teaching certificate side. Health wellness was more of the um, um, you know the biomechanics, those type of things. Health sciences. Mm -hmm. Right, maybe what used to be in the realm of kinesiology and that sort Absolutely. of thing. Okay. Absolutely, exactly, exactly. So I think it's a lot more specific nowadays. You know, mm -hmm. back then it was just this broad health wellness. Yeah. Okay. So you got out in 1990. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd been coaching up at uh, University of Oregon. Right. 
what what did you do at that point? Well, I was finishing up my prereqs to go to medical school. So I was okay. coaching at the University of Oregon. I was taking organic chemistry and all the physics and all the things that I needed to, f I think I had only taken a half a year of physics at Oklahoma State. So I needed to, to basically finish up my prereqs. I was taking my MCAT um, and I was still playing ball for Team USA and for a, a women's major program out of Northern California called the Reading Rebels. And um, then I had taken my MCATs, I was ready to go to medical school and I had this, I was with Team USA and we had gone on a trip to Japan and China and I got recruited to play uh, ball for a couple of Japanese teams and so I was trying to decide do I want to go to medical school or do I want to go to, you know, continue to play ball and, you know, I had both my applications <laughs> in my hand, I was sitting out in front of the Eugene airport with the, the DHL, which is like the FedEx office and I was trying to decide which one of these contracts envelopes do I mail? Do I mail my application to medical schools or do I mail my contract to play professionally in Japan? And I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll go to Japan and play one year. <laughs> That's what I thought. I'll go play one year, earn a little money, and then I'll go to medical school. And during that one year, everything changed. Um, everything in the sense of the softball world changed because it was announced that uh, we would be a, f a full medal sport in the 96 Olympics. And so that kind of made me think, oh, okay, wait, I'm already a member of Team USA. We're one of the top ranked teams in the world. The Olympics are in Atlanta, chance to play in the Olympics, win an Olympic medal. All right, maybe I'll put off medical school a little longer. And so I ended up staying and playing in Japan for 16 years, so. How, how did you get involved with the Japanese league? Well, um, I had to some friends from that teams, the summer teams I had played on that were actually already in Japan, and they had recruited me the year earlier to come over, but I, I was finishing my prereqs for medical school. I wasn't ready to go. I, I, you know, at that point, I was like, no, I just really want to, to go to medical school. That following summer, I went over to Japan and China f with Team USA, and then I got recruited by a lot more programs, so it was a little bit financially, it was a little bit more incentive for me to go over. In other words, the offers were better, and I thought, well, you know, it's one year, and if I'm ever going to do it, now's the time to do it. It's not like, you know, I can quit playing, go to medical school, and then come back. So um, that's kind of how that all worked out. Mm -hmm. Now, was the game any different in Japan, either philosophically or in practice? Uh, absolutely different, just because of the cultural differences and then just the way the game is played, because um, physiologically they are just a, they're smaller people than what we are. So they're more of a speed game. The U.S., we're more of a power game. Um, so there were a lot of different things that you had to really relate to. The Japanese, their work ethic um, and their sense of... Uh, success as far as if you want to be good at something it's all about the amount of time that you spend so it's the it's the quantitative aspect of their culture you want to be good you spend a lot of time with the US it's we're more qualitative it's you want to be good it's a good two-hour quality practice with the Japanese it's a good six-hour quantitative practice it's the quantity you want to be good you spend six hours US you want to be good you spend two good quality hours you know practicing mm -hmm. for instance that's just one example um, but yeah, as far as the game is concerned, it was more of a speed game. Um, you know, had to learn to adjust and adapt to their style of play or attack their style of play in a way that you know would allow me to be successful. And I was, I was fortunate. I did pretty good over there, um, especially being left-handed. They have a lot of lefty batters in their lineup, so that was an advantage for me um, as well. But it was, uh, yeah, it was it was tough. I mean, it was a it was a uh, big learning experience. It was a major, f I think. Um, a major time of growth in my life, you know, be, being out of my comfort zone, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, looking out the window in Japan going, holy cow, I'm in Japan, <laughs> what am I doing here? You know, you look out your window and you don't understand one sign, one anything, everybody looks different than you, mm -hmm. you know, you're away from your support staff, everybody who means anything to you, and it's like, wow, okay, but it was good. Yeah, so when you were there, were you there just for the season, and the, or... No, I was there mostly just for the season because I was still playing with Team USA. I was back That's and forth a lot, yeah. so it was a big time of travel for me. It was it was tiring in that sense, but I would spend about two to three months in the spring. I'd come home for the summers, um, June, July, August, play with Team USA. So I was constantly traveling with Team USA then, and then I'd go back over when everybody else would be done for the year. I would then go back over and still play for another three and a half months in Japan, and I'd finally be done with my season at the end of November, beginning of December. So I was basically competing from March 
Yeah, March through November, March through the beginning of December. It's a long season. A long season. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, were you doing other things at the time, too, to kind of make ends meet, or was playing for the league there enough? Playing for the league there was enough. I had endorsement deals because I was one of the top U.S. pitchers. So I was very fortunate. I mean, being a pitcher, you're kind of always in the spotlight, and so you have the uh, an opportunity a little bit more so. Um, and that's the reason I was over there. Most of the, all the athletes who have gone over and played professional in Japan have been um, – have been pitchers or catchers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess this gives us a chance to talk about mm -hmm. the endorsement mm -hmm. aspect. Mm -hmm. um, what does I, I think you were for softball one of the early mm -hmm. uh, early people to really get significant endorsements. Yeah. Is that is yeah? That correct? Myself, yeah. Lisa Fernandez, Dot Richardson were probably mm -hmm. the the three top athletes to have endorsement deals mm -hmm. through the mid 90s. Um, right. And what did having that sort of endorsement deal allow you to do as far as your career goes? Well, it allowed me to, to be a professional athlete. It allowed me to just train and not be like, okay, I got to find a job to support my hobby. Um, it allowed me to take my, um, my sport to a s level where that's all I did was was think about my sport. What I didn't have to worry about um, how I was going to pay my rent or any of that stuff, pay my expenses because I had the financial means to be able to focus on what I needed to focus on to be um, the best athlete that I could be. Yeah. Whereas my guess is that the Reading Rebels mm -hmm. were having to have day jobs in yeah, order absolutely. to be able to. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of the women would find. I mean, back in the '80s. 70s, 80s, before things really, and even into the early 90s, a lot of the women, they would take jobs where they knew they could get the summers off so they could play ball because they were that passionate about wanting to play ball. Um, uh, even nowadays, you know, a lot of the, the people that are still playing, they have to either have a very supportive boss who will allow them to take a big chunk of time off in the summer or their, their college coaches. Where, um, but even then, it's hard because they still have to recruit. The the um, the dynamics and the demands of a college coach nowadays are a lot higher than what they were um, back in the 80s and 90s. Just because there's so many more kids playing, there's so much more competition to recruit. There's so many more programs. So yes, there's more jobs, but at the same point, there is that many. There's those many, that many more demands on those coaches. So a lot of them. Um, don't have the opportunity to continue to play. Yeah, there's no real off season for e them anymore. E exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> now, um, what kind of a fan base did you have mm -hmm. in Japan? I had a big fan base in Japan. Yeah. Well, a lot of it was because I a was just different, and being American, the Japanese truly do appreciate Americans, um, and. Um, so yes, I looked different, but I played different too. I played with a lot of passion. A lot of the, when I first got over there, a lot of the Japanese because they're they're all about conformity. You know, they were like, um, almost like little robots in the sense that they did the same as everybody else. So nobody really wanted to stick out. When I first got over there, one of the executives at the company that I worked for, Toyota Industries, told me, Michelle, there's a Japanese saying that says, "A nail that sticks out is a nail that gets hammered down." And I was like, listen. You didn't bring me over here to be like you. You brought me over here to win and to be successful, and I need to be me. Why would you want me to come over here and be you? That's not what you want. You want me to be me to help win. And so I played with a lot of intensity, a lot of passion, a lot of fire on the, on the field. And, you know, a lot of the Japanese would be like, oh, <laughs> you know, they're not used to that. You because know? there's that reserve. Yes, exactly. Yeah. They're very reserved. They're all about blending in and not sticking out. And, you know, I'm playing with all this passion. If I, you know, got a big out or hit a home run, I'd be like, yeah, you know. And, you know, so all of a sudden, and it kind of, it grew. It became a little bit more um, contagious. I would see now my Japanese teammates starting to, our team was all of a sudden starting to little, look a little different. And then all of a sudden some of the other teams were like, oh, well, if, Toyota Shoki can do that. Well, then maybe you know we can show some emotion and do that. And, mm -hmm. and so it was kind of neat to see the way that the teams, um, the personalities now started to come out of the athletes. And that's what people want to see. I mean, people go watch the Yankees because they want to see A Rod and Derek Jeter. They don't go just to watch the Yankees. They go to watch the personalities, the people playing. I was going to say, and especially with pitchers. Absolutely, especially with pitchers because Fidrich yeah. or Oil Can Boy, yeah. or, you know. <laughs> Absolutely, the, your focus is on that person that's holding the ball at all times, you know. And when that personality comes out, it kind of hooks in the fans, and people want more of that. And well, and I, I think you you probably would have had trouble 
quote unquote blending in mm, anyway, absolutely. just because you've yeah. got this personality. You are a pitcher. Uh -huh. You're tall. You've got the yeah, hair. Exactly. <laughs> no, the hair. Exactly. I pitched with my hair down, which yeah. was a big thing. So the Japanese called me the lioness, you know, because my mane was always, you know, rah, when I was coming <laughs> off the mound. Um, yeah. So it just, you know, it ended up being something different and unique and it, it kind of hooked people in. So I, we had a really good following. And, um, and I think it was good for the sport. It was good for women's athletics, you know. And even now, you look at here's Japan going to play in the World Cup finals against Team USA on Sunday. That's huge for them. That's that's so great for the Japanese women. The Japanese women. I mean, as hard as it was for Team USA to lose that gold medal in the Beijing Olympics, um, that was a great thing for Japan. That's a good thing for sports in Japan. And it's a good, when sports in Japan does well, it's good for sports in the U.S. and it's good for women's sports around the world. I mean, I think sometimes in the U.S. we're so focused on we gotta win, we gotta win, that we forget that if we over dominate, it's not a good thing either. Not for the sport, not for women in general. So it's, it'd be like the Yankees winning the World Series every year. I mean, boring. Who wants to watch that? You know, you've got, you've got to create entertainment. Sports is entertainment. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you if it's not entertaining, if you always know the outcome, if you know the ending of the movie, you're not going to watch the movie over and over. You know. Yeah, that's that's another way to draw. You know? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what was what was the overall experience like um, it, with the uh, the Japanese league? Um, it was great. It was hard. It was hard being a foreigner. I mean, I had to not just beat the other team. A lot of times, I had to beat the umpires. I had to beat the stigma. I had to. But that was good. You know, I'm I'm kind of a stubborn person, so I was like, I am not going to let them beat me, and I'm going to figure out a way to get around the umpire. I'm going to figure out a way to win. So I was up for the challenge. It didn't. I didn't let it break me. Let's put it that mm -hmm. way. Um, and I had enough success that when I did have the failures, the failures motivated me to want to be even more successful, you know, to figure out a way to win, to figure out a way to be better. And um, just overall, it was a great experience. It got me out of my comfort zone. It made me realize that, you know, the world, there's a lot of opportunity out there. The world's a big place and you can make an impact. You know, one person can make an impact. You know, you hear all, oh, one person can't make a difference. That's baloney. One person can make a huge difference. And, and it taught me a lot. You know, the Japanese are very gracious people. And living in their environment and their culture taught me a lot about being a person as well. I mean, I remember some games, I'd be so upset if we lost a game for whatever reason. Um, you know, I, I just would be like, oh, you know, just mad, disappointed, just every emotion. Because we had so much pressure to win because the Japanese are all about if you win once, you got to keep winning. You know, it's all, always about getting better. You know, pitch a perfect game, the next game you got to pitch a perfect game. The, some of the expectations were truly unrealistic. Um, so there was a lot of pressure in that sense. Um, and because I was competitive and, and, you know, because I was paid to win, you know, for me, it would, I took that very seriously. And, um, you know, so if we had a bad game, I'd just be so mad and so upset. And then the second I'd walk out of that stadium, though, there'd be, you know, a thousand little, you know, black-haired little Japanese kids, boys, girls, everybody, ah! screaming just want to touch you just you know want to shake your hand just want an autograph and and I thought you know what they could care less I just if I if I stunk out there if we won if we lost they could they, they don't it didn't mean anything to them so, you know so it made me realize that your impact far your, your impact off the field goes much further than your impact on the field I mean yes people come out and they watch but you know they watch for that moment and then after that you have all these other abilities and moments to make a difference and so that for me really um, was profound because for a long time I had a hard time thinking about, okay, I've given up a career in medicine where I could, wanted to help people, make a difference and help people to play softball. I'm like, God, Michelle, that's really selfish. And then I realized that the instrument was different. Instead of a scalpel, it was a softball, but I was still doing the same thing. I was helping people. I was making a difference. I was spending time with a, a Japanese kid who was completely different than I was, but I was able to connect with them through a sport or through spending time. Um, and even though, you know, I, we didn't speak the same language and we looked completely different, I was still able to make a difference to that person. So for me, um, realizing those things was, was big, it made a huge impact on my life. It gave me a lot back. And is that what the camps and clinics are about that you do now? Yeah, absolutely. The camps, the clinics, being able to make a difference to these kids, being able to share a little bit of time with them and say, hey, you know what, I am just like you, and if I can do it, you know, some little country kid out of New Jersey, you know, if I can make a difference and go out and do things, then you can too. It's not going to be easy. Never, you know, no one's ever said it's going to be easy. It's going to be a challenge. And, but the challenge and, and the heart is what makes it great. 
Now let's let's talk about Team USA because mm-hmm. we we really do need to cover yeah, that. Yeah. That's a really important <laughs> part. Yeah. Um, how was that different from your collegiate experience when you started playing? Well, t- playing for Team USA is an honor. I mean, when you represent your institution in Oklahoma State, you just you know you're locked into that because it's you know it's that college atmosphere and you love wearing those colors and um, you know your rival Oklahoma is just down the street and you want to beat them and. Um, but when you represent your country, it's just, you know, that's that patriotic feel. Um, it's like uh, representing Oklahoma State on steroids, you know, it's like that, boom, it's that much, you know, it's that much bigger. Um, because you're, you're now representing not just OSU and OU and the Big 12, but the women's softball and Team USA and everybody that, the, U, the, the nation in general, you're representing all of us, you know, so it's just, it's that feel good, feel good feeling, <laughs> you know, on top of the feel good feeling. So. And as you mentioned, it's on the field and off the field. Absolutely, yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. You're sort of ambassadors at that point. Exactly, and um, and because we were so successful as Team USA, we we did get a lot of attention and notoriety depending on where we went. But we also had a lot of pressure and expectation because of that as well. Um, so you're watched absolutely on and off the field. Um, but for me. I was was a very patriotic person, um, so any time I slipped on that red, white, and blue jersey, whether or not it was for World Championships, Pan Ams, the Olympics, practice, it was an honor. I mean, to be one of the top 15 athletes in the country representing the number one team in the world, you know, it was a very it was very special. I never took it for granted. I always. Um, I always loved being there. I knew it was hard, and it was hard. There was a lot of sacrifices. I missed a lot of family events, and um, but it, you know, everything that's hard is you're going to have to pay that price for it. But it, but you're going to have benefit from it as well. Now, um, why don't you walk me through some of the highlights? Um, I know you've got Atlanta and Sydney. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, anything leading up to that, mm-hmm. but as far as Team USA goes. Yeah, I think that um, things really started to take off for me uh, in the early 90s, like 93, and before I went to Japan, I played at those International Cups in uh, Japan and China, and threw a perfect game in China, and we ended up winning that World Cup, and I was MVP of that tournament, and since that point, things really started to kind of excel. So um, <clears throat> went to the Pan American Games, um, and the World Championships in 94 and 95. Uh, we won gold medals at both of those. I was a you know, big part of the staff there. Myself and Lisa Fernandez at the time were probably the top two pitchers on the team, along with Michelle Granger. So there were probably the three of us were probably the top three pitchers in the world at the time. And then leading into the um, Atlanta Games, that was big, you know, being able to be in Atlanta, be in your home country, your fans and your friends and um, your family are all able to be there. And uh, the only disappointing part of Atlanta is that NBC didn't realize they underestimated the scope at which and how popular softball was going to be, and they didn't really give us any TV time. That was like pre-cable, you know, so it was mostly just network um, TV. And uh, so that was unfortunate because the games were phenomenal. They were sold out. The energy was just electric. Um, and uh, and that was a that was a big event. Being a part of that was was unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And then um, you know, kind of the three years in between um, Atlanta and, and Sydney would again go back to being um, World Championships and Pan Ams. We won those again, and then we went down to Sydney in 2000, and uh, you know that was a struggle. We lost three games in a row, and you know we had won Atlanta. We lost one game in Atlanta to Australia, but we basically came through and and, and won that. Um, even though the games were tight, it, it was, you know, we looked like we were in control. We go down to Sydney, we're number one, we re- lose three games in a row, it looks like we might not even make the medal round. So then we finally make the medal round, and um, we have to beat every team that has beaten us in round robin, which was great because that was like the ultimate comeback, you know. So we got to, to play China again and we beat them. We got to play Australia again and we beat them in the semifinal game and then the gold medal game we beat Japan. 
to win um, that second gold medal in a row. So each Olympics was special for different reasons. You know, Atlanta, because it was the very first time. Atlanta, I felt like I won two gold medals because as I talked about, the date of my accident was July 21st, 1986. The first ever Olympic softball game was Team USA against Puerto Rico on July 21st, 1996. Ten years to the day of the accident that A, almost killed me, but B, you know, they, they said I'd never pitch again. So I talk about perseverance a lot of times when I do motivational speaking. I talk about never giving up and I talk about you never know why things happen. You know, it took me 10 years to figure out why I went through all that. I mean, I learned a lot really early on, but I felt like that was a, that closed a chapter in my life. The day I walked onto that field, I will never forget walking onto that stadium grass, coming through the right field gate, walking onto that and hearing the Olympic music playing and seeing the people in the stands and I, the, men, the second I stepped on that field, that grass out in the right field, I felt like I had won my first gold medal. Because for me, that was a, it was a huge day. And um, we ended up beating uh, Puerto Rico in that game. I was, a, I was a designated hitter. I didn't start pitching that game, but I was a designated hitter. And yeah, that was, that was pretty amazing. So when you look at Atlanta, it's special for me because of my accident, because it was the first ever Olympics. And then Sydney was special just because we stunk it up. And then we came back and won, found a way to one. So it was hard, you know, it was so, it was so controversial and hard, but we ended up winning. That's what made it so great. What's it like for the medal, to be there for the medal ceremony? Yeah, I mean, any medal ceremony is phenomenal, but when you're in the Olympics and you are announced as, you know, the winner of the gold medal and your whole team steps up on that top podium together holding hands and they put that ribbon around your neck, it's the most amazing feeling in the world. All that, all that hard work, all of that emotion and everything that you've missed, everything that was so hard, is just so worth it at that very moment, you know, and, um, you know, especially when I think about that, I just think, wow, that was very, very, very emotional moment, um, very special moment, especially sharing it with my family or the people that saw, the people that were close and realized how much I sacrificed, how many, how many events that you missed, how many Thanksgivings I wasn't able to be home for, all these things that you just miss out on in life that a lot of people don't realize that you're sacrificing um, to represent you know, your, your country and to be a part of that. So it's, uh, I mean, any medal that you win is special, but it's always really nice when it's the right color, when it's gold. <laughs> <laughs> now, mm -hmm. softball in the Olympics has had a changing status. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. Do you want to talk real quickly about sure, that? Sure, just, just real to, quick, we can yeah. talk about that. Yeah, unfortunately in, t um, in, unfortunately in 2005, um, the... Uh, IOC session in Singapore voted softball out of the Olympics and it was really was unfortunately a comedy of errors. It was a tie vote 52-52. We just needed a simple majority. majority. So if one person would have voted yes, um, we would have, softball would still be in the Olympic Games. But we got lumped in with baseball. Baseball had their issues because of drug testing, because they don't send their best athletes, because Major League Baseball and the IOC are kind of button heads on some issues. We kind of got lumped in and we, we got pulled out. So they voted both baseball and softball out of the, um, of the London Games, the 2012 Games. It takes seven years to either pull a sport out or, or enter a sport. Um, so the 2005 decision affected the London 2012 games. I was then a member of a committee put on by the ISF, the International Softball Federation, called Back Softball, where we tried to lobby the IOC to revote because there were some things that were very unfair about that vote in Singapore. A lot of the IOC members didn't know if they were voting with the way the questions were asked. They didn't know if they were voting for or against softball. Um, so that was it was unfortunate, um, and in a lot of different ways. So. We tried to get them to re-vote. They wouldn't re-vote. Then there was another vote that came down in 2009, and that was to be on the 2016 uh, program. We knew we would be out of London 2012. We, we were trying to get on the 2016 program, that, which is going to be now in Rio. And unfortunately, baseball and softball did not get on that. It is going to be, um, they, they then voted to put in golf and rugby, which to me is I don't understand because the IOC, you know, they speak out of both sides of their mouth. They say that they want youth sports, they want growth. Well, last I checked, not a whole lot of youth play golf. You know, it's more of an adult sport, and it's a very elitist sport because a lot of people can't afford to play it. Um, and rugby is, is, especially for women, is not a sport that's played. When you look at softball, there are more, lots more softball players around the world than there are female rugby players. Um, so there's a lot of different things that, that, that we're battling. 
um, for both baseball and softball. There is hopefully hope that baseball and softball will combine to be one sport. Major League Baseball will kind of kiss and make up with the IOC, and both baseball and softball will go in together as one sport and hopefully get back on the 2020 program. But we won't know that till 2013. Again, it's that seven-year window, so hopefully there'll be a vote in 2013, in two years, to get us on the 2020 program. Okay. So how long were you with Team USA? I was with Team USA from 1990 two or three till 2002. I retired at the Japan Cup in September of 2002 because uh, we had a new head coach come in. I was playing professionally in Japan and he basically said if I wanted to be on the Athens team in 2003, um, which wasn't even the Olympic year, I was going to have to miss a lot of my professional season. And I wasn't at that point having already been in two Olympic games. I wasn't ready to give up my job basically where I was getting paid to, pl to play. Um, ball for um, to play in another Olympic Games where we really didn't have much financial support. Mm -hmm. So it was a hard decision, but it ended up being a great decision because as soon as I got out of competing for Team USA, even though I still pl I still played professionally for another six years after that, so I was still playing, you know, as still one of the best ball players in the world. I just didn't have the time to be able to do both things anymore. But what it allowed me to do is it allowed me to start doing more broadcasting, and so it kind of parlayed me from being a member of Team USA into being a broadcaster for Team USA. And so that really ended up as hard as a decision as that was. And believe me, I pined over that for quite a while because who wouldn't want to play in the Athens Olympics? You know, that's like the birthplace of the Olympic Games. That just could have been phenomenal. Um, but 9-11 had just happened. My parents were, you know, they said, Michelle, even if you do play in Athens, we're not going to go over. I would have had no family and friends really supporting me. So, and you know, that's the most special part of the Olympics. And I already been there twice. It was almost like, all right, it's time to let someone else, to, it's time to, to come out of that slot and give someone else an opportunity to mm -hmm. share and, and enjoy their Olympic moment. You know, mm -hmm. some of these younger athletes coming up. So, um, so I think it was a tough decision, but it was a very good decision. I remember I just kept telling myself, um, r repeating, you know, to myself, "Don't be afraid to give up the good for the great." In other words, playing for Team USA was good, but there was something else great out there waiting for me. Mm -hmm. And you've you played uh in japan through 2008 and then Correct. retired yep at that point so what is what is the great now um the great now is is the broadcasting it's um work in camps and clinics i've been working a little bit with um with musco sports lighting um being able to represent them do some different things with general tommy franks i've had the opportunity to go to the middle east and and work um in different uh appearances you know, talking to women in the Middle East and trying to inspire them and say, you know, just, you know, be patient, hang in there. You know, women, women are supporting. We need to support each other more, but we are supporting you. And, um, you, you know, hopefully you're going to have the opportunity to live your dreams. And, um, you know, it gives me perspective to be able to come back here and realize how much we do have compared to a lot of women around the world who don't have the opportunity to do many things, you know. So, um, so I'm doing a lot of different things. I'm, as far as being an athlete, I'm doing triathlons now. So I do a lot of cycling. I always did a lot of cycling to stay in shape for my pitching, but now I've kind of parlayed that in a little bit more into running and swimming and just staying busy. So I, I do a lot of different things and, and I enjoy it. You know, I feel blessed. Mm -hmm. Now, is there anything that we haven't discussed that you'd like to touch on before we finish up? Any um, final thoughts? Or? A couple of the charities that I, uh, I really enjoy working with, um, one specifically is called Softball for Hearts, and it was started by a gentleman whose daughter had a heart transplant at 17 days old, um, and she is now a, uh, I think she's 16 years old, she's a 16-year-old catcher, and uh, she's a great little athlete. She's one of the oldest living heart recipients, because um, usually a transplanted heart usually only has a life of anywhere between you know, 14 and 15 years, somewhere in that area. So she's already, her heart um, is, is already, you know, still hanging in there. And, but he started that charity because he, he does financially well. He can afford all the drugs, the anti-rejection drugs and all the medical expenses um, because he's, he's blessed. He's got a good job. But there are a lot of families where one illness like this just really wrecks them and the siblings don't have opportunities to do things. It's really hard. So we raise money to um, help out these families of children who have heart defects and ha need heart transplants. And um, 
you know, try to, to give time to that, but it's, uh, yeah, it's called softball for hearts. And then we've, we actually parlayed it into other things. We call it athletes for hearts and we'll do a fishing tournament. So fishing for hearts and, you know, different things. So hopefully we'll be able to continue to build that and make a difference. Mm -hmm. Was there another one too that you wanted? Um, there are some other ones that we're working on. They're not fully developed okay. um, yet, but yeah, I, I enjoy um, being able to make a difference, you know, and give back because there's so many people that have have needs, um, you know, emotional needs or financial needs and just support needs. And mm -hmm. so hopefully to be able to to be able to make a difference to them is a, is a big part of what I like to do now. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. Mm -hmm. We You're really welcome. appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure.